Just a few short videos ago, we introduced the algebraic eigenproblem. Now in chapter three, we've been looking at how we can apply the eigenfunction expansion approach to ordinary differential equations. Now we're gonna extend that to partial differential equations. Now there's actually no reason to think that the eigenfunction expansion approach that we've been using for ODEs should apply to PDEs as well, but it turns out that it does in certain circumstances, namely when separation of variables applies. And that's what we're gonna look at in this in the next two videos. So the key to all this is separation of variables, and you'll see how we can use this to convert our partial differential equations into a set of ordinary differential equations to which we can then apply the eigenfunction expansion approach. So that's gonna be the basic pattern that you'll see. So we're gonna be building on the approaches and the ideas that we've been using in applying the eigenfunction expansion approach to ordinary differential equations. In this video, we'll apply it to the Laplace's equation, and in the next video, we'll apply it to the unsteady diffusion equation, and then finally in the wave equation. Each of these are canonical or standard partial differential equations that represent a class of PDEs. So Laplace's equation is characteristic of what are known as elliptic PDEs, and the unsteady diffusion equation is characteristic of what is known as parabolic PDEs, and then the wave equation is characteristic of what is known as hyperbolic PDEs. So we're gonna use the Laplace equation to introduce this method of separation of variables. It's actually quite simple and straightforward. I can show it to you in one slide and it dramatically extends the scope of problems that we can use these eigenfunction expansion approaches to solve. So here's Laplace's equation, partial squared u partial x squared plus partial squared u partial y squared is equal to zero. So u here could be the temperature in a steady heat conduction context. It could be the electrostatic field and a number of other applications as well. And then we could have for boundary conditions u or the normal derivative of u being specified on the boundaries. For elliptic PDE, such as Laplace's equation, we need boundary conditions defined at every point on the boundary. So we call it a boundary value problem. So here's the whole key. So we have a function u of x, y. That's what we're looking for. It's now two-dimensional instead of one-dimensional. That's why it's a partial differential equation instead of an ordinary differential equation. What we're going to try, and again, there's no reason to think that this is gonna work. We're just gonna try it. We're gonna try to separate the variables in the following way. So we're gonna suppose that u of x, y can be written as the product of two functions, one only being a function of x and the other only being a function of y. And the proof is in the pudding, as they say. If we substitute this in, if we can separate the variables, as you'll see, then we can argue that we've converted this into two ODEs instead of one PDE, as you'll see in a moment. So let's just substitute it in and see what happens. So we substitute this in for u. The first term is partial squared u partial x squared. So we take the partial derivative of, of this product with respect to x. So psi is only a function of y, so that x is like a constant. And then partial squared phi partial x squared, well that's really just now d squared phi dx squared. It's an ordinary derivative because phi is only a function of x. And then the second term is partial squared u partial y squared. So same idea, phi is only a function of x, so that x is like a constant. And then we have the second derivative of psi with respect to y, which is now an ordinary derivative, d squared psi dy squared. So let's try to put everything involving x on the left side and everything involving y on the right. So we take this over to the right-hand side of the equation and then divide by psi phi. So we have one over phi times d squared phi dx squared on the left-hand side, all of which only depends on x, and then minus one over psi d squared psi dy squared all of which only depends on y. Now listen closely, because here's the logic as to why this works. So x is an independent variable, y is an independent variable. So that means I can vary them independently. I could hold x constant and only vary y. I could hold y constant and only vary x. So for example, if I were to hold x constant, then nothing changes on the left-hand side of the equation if I vary the y on the right-hand side, well, because that's equal to this constant on the left, that has to remain a constant as well. So we can set this equal to what we'll call a separation constant, lambda. Now the fact that we use lambda may give you a clue that that's somehow related to an eigenvalue, and in fact it is. So this is the sense in which we are separating the variables. We're supposing that we can write u of x, y as the product of two functions, one a function of x only, one a function of y only. We substitute it into the PDE, and we determine if we can put all the x terms on one side and all the y terms on the other side. If so, 
then we can argue that those are then equal to a constant, the separation constant lambda. So now if you take the left-hand side, which only involves phi and x, that has to equal to lambda. Likewise, the right-hand side, which only involves y and psi, also has to equal lambda. So that gives us two ordinary differential equations. If we write them in the normal form, that's d squared phi dx squared minus lambda times phi is equal to zero, and d squared psi dy squared plus lambda times psi is equal to zero. So once again, we've converted our one second order PDE and x and y into two second order ODEs, one in x, one in y, one for phi of x and one for psi of y. Now there's no reason to think this would apply to any PDE, so there's certainly no reason to think it's gonna to apply to all PDEs, and it doesn't. There are PDEs that are separable, such as Laplace's equation, and the other two we'll look at in subsequent videos, and there are other equations, there's examples in the book, including Schrodinger's equation used in physics. So now we have two ordinary differential equations. At this stage, they both look like differential eigenproblems. They have the lambda in them, they both have differential operators, but in fact, only one of them is a differential eigenproblem. And so let's think about how to determine which one it is. So it depends on the boundary conditions. Remember, for a differential eigenproblem, both of the boundary conditions on either end have to be homogeneous and that is the eigenproblem. And that's the one we'll consider first. That's the differential eigenproblem, which we'll address first using the exact same approach as we've been using in the last several videos. And then we use the eigenvalues, the lambdas that we've obtained, to solve the second of the two equations. So let's see how that works out in a particular example. So we're gonna couch this in terms of heat conduction. So we'll be talking about temperature distribution, as our u of x, y. The math all applies regardless of the application, but we'll use this as an example to illustrate the process. So let's say we have on the x, y plane a rectangular domain from 0 to a in x and 0 to b in y. And let's say that u is equal to 0 on the left, on the bottom, and on the right and then u is equal to some function of x, some known function of x on the top, and then we're looking for u of x, y in the interior of our rectangle. So we have two homogeneous boundary conditions in the x direction, so that will be our eigenproblem, and then on the bottom we have homogeneous, and on the top we have a specified temperature distribution, and that's obviously a non-homogeneous boundary condition. So those are just stated here. Okay, so we've done the separation of variables already, we have d squared phi dx squared minus lambda times phi is equal to zero. You'll notice I put the subscript ends on the lambdas and the phi's to indicate that they are eigenvalues and eigenfunctions. We've actually already done this problem, and we find that for lambda being zero or positive, we only get trivial solutions, and we need lambda to be negative in order to get non-trivial solutions. So we set lambda is equal to minus mu sub n squared, and that sets the lambda to be negative. The solution that we get, this was done in an earlier example, is a constant times cosine mu x plus another constant times sine of mu x. So at this stage, we're just using the basic methods that we've developed for solving ODEs using eigenfunction expansion. So I'm gonna go through this relatively quickly because we've seen this before. Now the one thing we have to look at a little more carefully is the boundary conditions. The boundary conditions are on u, but now we have an equation for phi. So we have that u at x is equal to zero is zero. But u is phi times psi. Psi is a function of y, and phi applied at x is equal to zero, that has to be zero. So that's our boundary condition for phi. So once again, we need homogeneous boundary conditions on u, and those translate into homogeneous boundary conditions on phi as well. So if x is equal to zero, then phi is equal to zero, so that requires that c1 be zero, because cosine of zero, of course, is one, it's not zero, so we have to get rid of that term by setting c1 to be equal to zero. So that gives us that phi sub n is a constant times sine of mu x. So we also have the boundary condition that at x is equal to a, u has to be zero. So similar to the previous argument, phi at x is equal to a also has to be zero. For that to be true, I put in a for x and zero for phi, so that requires that sine mu sub n times a is equal to zero. That is our characteristic equation. 
and the usual eigenfunction expansion approach. So from that, we get our mu's, which are related back to the lambdas, the eigenvalues. So for sine of something to be zero, the something has to be an integer multiple of pi. So that means that mu has to be n pi over a, so that the a's cancel, and you get n pi, where n is an integer, and then that satisfies our characteristic equation. And then for the eigenfunctions, we have that phi n is c2 sine mu nx, but we now know mu, so phi sub n is c2 times sine of n pi over a times x. Those are the eigenfunctions of our differential operator that we obtain from the differential eigen problem. Now the c2 is arbitrary at this stage. We could determine it such that phi is normalized to length one. We could set it equal to one for convenience, which is what I'm gonna do here because I'm feeling kind of lazy at the moment. So now let's talk about the second ODE. So we have d squared psi dy squared minus mu squared times psi is equal to zero. We now know what the lambda is. So we had plus lambda in this equation, but lambda is minus mu squared and mu is n pi over a. So that goes in here for the mu sub n squared. So we solve this using the usual approach to solving ordinary differential equations, second order OD with constant coefficients and we get a constant times cosh plus a constant times sinh of n pi over a times y. We put in the lower boundary condition at y is equal to zero, which is homogeneous. That requires that psi at y is equal to zero also be zero, and cosh of zero is one, so we have to set c3 equal to zero to get rid of that first term in order for the psi to be equal to zero. So we just have that psi sub n is equal to c4 cinch of n pi over a times y. So let's put this all together now and see where we're at. So our solution u of x, y is now written as a sum of all the u sub n of x, y's, of which there's an infinity of them, corresponding to each of the eigenfunctions. The u sub n's are the phi sub n's times the psi sub n's, and we know the phi sub n's are the sine of n pi over a times x, and then the size of y's from here those are cinch of n pi over a times y. Now we're going to combine the constants into our a sub n coefficients, which we still need to determine to get the solution. But you'll notice that's the only thing that's left to determine. We know everything else about the solution. We know the behavior in x. We know the behavior in y. Now the way you can think about this is the sine of n pi over a x. Those are the phi's. Those are the eigenfunctions. And then the psi of y, which are the cinch terms, those are essentially variable coefficients in our eigenfunction expansion. So for ODEs, we have our eigenfunctions, constant coefficients. Now for PDEs, we have our eigenfunctions, and then variable coefficients in the other variable. Okay, so our job now is to determine the A sub N coefficients. There's still one more boundary condition. That's the boundary condition at the top of our domain that we have not yet used. We'll use that to get those coefficients. So we apply our solution at y is equal to b. So y is equal to b, y is equal to b, and that is equal to f of x. That's the temperature distribution along the top boundary when y is equal to b. So we know the phi sub n of x's, and we're looking for the psi sub n of b's. Each of those are constants because it's just the psi at a particular location, y is equal to b. We get this exactly the same way we did for ODEs. We take the inner product, of each of the eigenfunctions with this expression. And because of the orthogonality of the eigenfunctions, every single term in this infinite sum is going to vanish because it's the inner product of one eigenfunction with another one. They're all gonna vanish because those inner products are all zero because of orthogonality, except for when m and n are the same. That's the only term that gives us a non-zero result. That non-zero result is the square of the norm of phi sub n. Remember the square of the norm of a function is the inner product of the function with itself. And then times the psi sub n of b. Then on the right hand side we have the inner product of f with the corresponding eigen function. So we know everything in this equation. We know this, this, and this. We can evaluate that inner product. The only thing we don't know is the psi sub n of b. So we solve for that. We have psi is that inner product of f with the eigen functions, phi sub n over the square of the norm. That inner product 
is just an integral of f of x times the phi sub n's, which are the sines. So this integral right here, those are the Fourier sine coefficients of whatever the f of x function happens to be. Now this 2 over a, that's 1 over the norm squared, just evaluating that norm integral. Okay, so from the previous slide then we have that the a n coefficients that we're looking for are just psi sub n of b, which we've just determined an expression for, over the cinch of n pi b over a. So we can now evaluate those coefficients a sub n given a function f of x. So now we substitute back into our final solution and we have the psi n of b over the cinch of n pi b over a. These two terms are the same as what we had before and now we've evaluated these where this integral gives us the psi sub n of b coefficients. So let's take a look at a particular example. Let's make the domain square, so a, b are both 1, and let's just pick f of x as a constant 1. So we have a zero temperature on the left, bottom and right boundaries, and then temperature of 1 on the top. Then you can evaluate the Fourier sine coefficients of f of x, which is 1, and you get this expression in terms of cosines. So then you can evaluate the psi at b, which is now 1, and then we can substitute all that back into the final solution for u of x, y. So this is an analytical solution, it's equal, if you keep all infinity of these terms. And if I plot that, this is what the solution looks like. So we have a zero temperature here, here, and here, and a temperature of one on the upper boundary. So these are contours of constant temperature, u, constant values of u, 0.1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, and then the top boundary is 1. And you can see because of the abrupt change in boundary condition from 0 here and 1 here, 0 here and 1 here, that the contours all pile up in those corners. So the gradients get very, very large in those corners, but this is the exact solution of Laplace's equation given those boundary conditions 0, 0, 0, and 1 based on an eigenfunction expansion for the ODEs that result from the separation of variables technique applied to our Laplace equation. So let's make a few comments about this. So the solution we're looking for, u of xy, is written as the sum of all the u sub n of xy's, which correspond to each of the infinity of eigenfunctions phi times their variable coefficients, psi. So Laplace's equation, remember, is a linear differential equation, so we can use superposition each of these is a solution of Laplace's equation. To get the most general solution, we have to superimpose them. So we sum them up using summation to get the full, exact, and most general solution. Now this approach worked because we had, of our four boundaries, three of them were homogeneous. Two that define the eigenproblem, in this case in the x-direction, and then we had zero on the bottom and non-homogeneous on the right. That allowed us to solve this completely using this approach. But what happens if we don't have three homogeneous boundary conditions? Let's say we have two that are non-homogeneous. So x, y, so we have our rectangular domain. Now let's say we have zero and zero here, f of x on the top, but now also g of y. So we have two non-homogeneous boundary conditions. What do we do? Well, we can use superposition just like we just discussed. So we could break this up into two separate problems, both of which we can solve. We have zero, 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 f of x, that's the one we just solved, and then we get the solution for 0, 0, 0, g of y, using a similar technique. That's a lot of extra work, but there'll be a lot of similarities with the first problem. And then we sum those two solutions, get the solution of the original problem that had two non-homogeneous boundary conditions. So we can take advantage of superposition to handle more challenging situations.